Hello and welcome everyone to the Top 10 Fair Data Things Global Sprint Webinar. The actual sprint is on the 29th and 30th of November 2018, everywhere around the world. And today's webinar is basically to give you a bit of an introduction and overview of the sprint and um, to talk about how you can participate in it. So it's brought to you by Library Carpentry, the ARDC and the Research Data Alliance Library for Research Data Interest Group. Okay, so today's webinar, um, before we get started, there's a bit of an overview of some of the things we're gonna cover. It's only a short half hour webinar, so we're gonna talk fairly quickly through these things, but you will have a chance to ask questions. Before we get started, just a bit of an introduction to the speakers today. So I'm Natasha Simons, I'm the Associate Director for a program called Skilled Workforce with the Australian Research Data Commons, and I'm based at the University of Queensland in Brisbane. So the ARDC was established this year and it's a combination of the Australian National Data Service or AMS, uh, Nectar and RDS, the Research Data Services, to meet the needs of data intensive, cross-disciplinary and global collaborative research. And the ARDC is supported by the Australian Government through the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy. Over to you, Keith. Thank you. And my name's Keith Russell, manager manager of engagements within the Australian Research Data Commons. Chris. I am uh, Chris Erdman, and I'm the Library Carpentry Community and Development Director. And Liz. Hi, I'm Liz Stokes. I'm um, formerly from UTS, and I've just joined the skilled workforce team at the Australian. Uh, research data commons. Excellent, thank you everyone. Okay, we'll go to the next, oh, there's a link to the slide deck there if anyone wants to load them. So the first uh, topic is the who, what, and why about the global, global sprint. Okay, so the top 10 fair data global sprint is organized by Library Carpentry, by the ARDC, and the Research Data Alliance Libraries for Research Data Interest Group. It basically came about because uh, there's a need to develop uh, some educational and resources in uh, FAIR data for different research disciplines. There's a lot available that covers FAIR in general, but we're actually missing quite a lot of information in a disciplinary sense, which is where FAIR makes a lot of, where FAIR really comes to light. So we've organised this sprint in collaboration with a number of global partners, Foster Open Science, Open Air, the Research Data Alliance in Europe, the Data Management Training Clearinghouse, which comes out of ESIP, the California Digital Library, uh, the Dryad Repository, Arnet, Dance, and the Center for Digital Scholarship at Leiden University Library. And if you want to get an overview of the sprint, there's a link there to the Library Carpentry blog where the sprint was announced. Okay, so the purpose of the sprint, as I mentioned, is to create a wide range of top 10 fair data things by research disciplines and or we also have themes as another way that you could slice and dice this particular sprint. So what is actually a top 10 fair data things resource? Well, hopefully a number of you listening today have actually done or been involved in the ANS or Research Data Alliance 23 research data things. Uh, so things, if you've been through that program, you will have noticed that things is a neat concept for creating packaged content on any topic that you choose. And each thing is basically a self-directed learning activity for anyone who wants to know more about that particular topic. In this case, it's about fair research data. So the resources that we create during the sprint, the idea is that they can be used by the research community to understand fair in those different disciplines and different theme con contexts as well as providing people with some initial steps that they want to consider to make their data fair. So here's an example of the top 10 things. In this case, it's not actually a top 10 fair thing specifically, but it is a top 10 health and medical things related to research data. So this was created by ANS um, before we're now joined with the ARDC, but we don't have the branding on that poster. Um, however, you get the idea of what is covered in this. Um, in this particular resource. So the example I've pulled out there is thing two, which is issues in research data management. And with this particular, with these particular top 10 things, you can pick um, different activity levels that you want to engage in. And some of the activities are like, read something here and think about it and then make a comment on it. Or it might be go and try this new tool and see what it does for you in the data management area 
or it might be critiquing something. Uh, so there's different types of activities that people can in, can do that's more than just a sort of passive reading of materials. So the, the 10 things is about doing something. So you read something, you start to understand it, and then you reflect on what you've read and you make a comment on it, or you create some, or you try out some new tools or some new ways of doing things. So that's the whole uh, sort of essence really of the 10 things. And there's a link there so you can explore those. These are resources are then available for anybody to use, whether you're in top 10 medical and health or not. Uh, anyone can actually go along and do that, do, do those top 10 things whenever they'd like to. So if this is new to you, which it probably is, <laughs> particularly the creation of the resources, um, we created a primer, which is basically a set of instructions that will help guide you through the creation of your top 10 FAIR data uh, resources for different disciplines. And I've put the link to the tiny URL there, but it's basically just a few pages that tells you how you'd go about this, which is essentially not to start with a, another top 10, either, although it's good to see that example, but to actually start with the 23 things and start with some bigger ideas and then start to sort of skin down from there how you might want to get to 10 and whether you want to do different levels within each 10. So you might have one thing and you might have three different levels in there, a beginner, intermediate or advanced, or just different types of activities that people can choose from. Because the one thing we found through the 23 things is that people really like choices and they like to be able to do things and they like to be able to talk about them. So just consider those things when you're creating your, your top 10 resource. Uh, so Natasha asked me to speak very briefly on the FAIR data principles. Now I'm guessing most people here will have known, already seen the FAIR data principles and already know them really well. So I'm going to keep this short and I'm trying to I'll try and focus it on what does this mean? What, how can you think about this in the context of the 10 FAIR ten, uh, research data things? So the FAIR data principles were drafted in a workshop in Leiden, uh, uh, the Lawrence Centre 2015 and uh, subsequently the um, the um, original authors and a few other people sort of wrote an article in Nature about this and that received a lot of international recognition and uptake by all sorts of different organizations uh, and funders and policy bodies and j journals and all across the board. And I think one of the, there's a few factors that led to, that contributed to the success of the Fair Data Principles. I think one thing was the angle in which they talked about not only making data usable for humans, but also for machines and how to actually prepare data in a way that machines can pick up the data and use it and use it in data intensive science or data intensive, intensive research. Um, the FAIR data principles are formulated in a way that they're technology agnostic. They're not based around one specific technology solution. Uh, they address uh, elements both uh, regarding the data and the metadata. And I think that broader perspective, I think is really helpful and useful. And they were set up in a way that were, was discipline independent, um, so uh, not focused on one discipline specifically. However, um, because they're discipline independent, it uh, means there is not a lot of guidance in the principles strictly about wh what you need to do as a researcher to make your data fair in a specific discipline. So that's one of the gaps that uh, has since appeared and a lot we're getting a quite a bit few questions from different groups, different research communities saying, well, yes, we'd like to make our data fair, but how do we do it? What are the things we need to do in our discipline? What I tried to do here is mention for each of the fair data principles very briefly things you can think about um, uh, that you could talk about when you're thinking about making data fair in a specific discipline. So, for example, when you're talking about making data findable, um, elements on the right hand, uh, right hand side, you'll see uh, the actual original principles. And on the left, you can see a few things you can think about. So, for example, in a specific discipline or a specific domain, are there uh, uh, types of persistent identifiers that are, are common, are used? Uh, um, is there a sp specific discovery metadata that's common and relevant? So, for example, in geosciences, you might want to have discovery metadata that describes where the data set is about. So, what is the uh, what, what are the geographical boundaries of the data set, for example? And um, if you're talking about making the data findable, are there discipline-specific repositories or registries that uh, um, uh, that the data should be uh, either deposited in or uh, be um, findable through these routes? When thinking about accessible, accessible is also an element in, um, uh, th there's different ways of thinking about accessible. 
basically you just talk about um, uh, protocols to get access to the data there's also questions you can think about and how open uh, can the data be made what sort of considerations and protocols are there in that discipline uh, around making data available um, uh, is it uh, can, can it be made very open are there uh, um, procedures around sensitive data that uh, uh, that can be copied can be used etc um, are there uh, platforms or solutions out there that researchers can use to provide access to sensitive data and uh, in some cases uh, it's more valuable not just to have the data as a download but to provide the data through data services which can be interrogated by machines or humans if, if that is the case what sort of data services are common are standards in in that in that specific discipline Interoperable is always a complicated one. Uh, when talking about interoperable, it's a lot about actual uh, the content of the data and, and to, uh, to a certain extent also the metadata, uh, what language is used to represent that data. And things you can think about there, are there standard file formats? Are there standard ways of uh, making data available in, in, that, uh, in that discipline? Are there standard vocabularies and ontologies uh, that can be used either to reference the data to, to use uh, when um, creating the data or the metadata and uh, where can those vocabularies be found are there places where those vocabularies uh, are deposited and um, when looking at relating data to other information and other uh, outputs out there um, are there identifiers that are common in that discipline uh, to uh, point off to related information for example identifiers for projects, identifiers for samples, identifiers for authors, um, so that you can actually create links uh, and uh, qualified references between bits of information that is out there. The fourth letter, reusable, um, covers a range of other elements which are useful on top of making data, data findable at accessible and interoperable because you need to do that anyway to make it reusable but on top of that there's a few other aspects you can also think about so is there a, a, a around licensing is there a standard is there a practice in the discipline uh, around licensing data um, uh, one of the other elements there is um, uh, provenance attaching provenance information to your to your data so is there a discipline specific approach around provenance is there a standard that people use is something you could point people to and uh, finally um, are there community standards for the data and the metadata that uh, um, that researchers can adhere to can use which will increase the reusability of that data or that resource so that was those are all aspects broken down by those four or by the four letters in the in the fair data principles um, however there's also may well also be other elements that you might want to pull in for your 10 uh, fair 10 uh, research data things so and those can be more general disciplinary context uh, that would be useful to incorporate so uh, for example are there relevant po uh, policies that uh, funders or journals or associations or societies have in the discipline uh, are they starting to push for fair have they got guidance in that space um, is that something you want to point the researchers to and for example are there other standard approaches templates or tools or materials out there that researchers should be aware of uh, that they can use and pick up just to make it easier for them to make their data fair so these are just a few things to trigger your thinking when you're thinking about I want to do 10 fair research data things these are elements you could for example include and bring on board so that's my perspective and I'm happy to hand over thanks Keith uh, so how will this work um, so uh, to, to begin to start um, we'll be using the Monash zoom um, so uh, the zoom link will be open throughout the sprint and we'll have uh, we'll have uh, individuals we'll have people in the sprint sort of there uh, to help um, guide um, different groups, different individuals that um, are trying to tackle a different theme or discipline. Uh, so on the hour, every every hour, uh, we have check-ins, and people can come in and discuss what they're working on, um, and and ask questions, get feedback, or just have general conversations. Um, but it's a good it's a good way for people to come to to check in and see what others are working on and get a sense of what what they might want to tackle as well it's a great it's a great check-in um, tool um, but if you're unable to make it into the zoom or if you actually need 
uh, an answer quickly. Um, we have a, a Gitter channel, so we have a chat room where the link is is also listed there, um, where you can actually um, just chat with um, individuals across across the world um, that are working on uh, you know different di different aspects. Um, uh, and you could you could ask ask them something that you're you're facing, um, and and just connect with them as well. Um, so one way the chat works is you can use the at symbol um, to actually talk to uh, certain people directly. And there are already about 20 people that have already signed up. And you can sign up with your GitHub account or a Twitter account. Um, so you, you can you can communicate with people that way and check in um, throughout throughout the sprint. Uh, the other uh, method um, that we're using uh, to indicate that people are working on um, the sprint and working on disciplines or themes is uh, a registration um, uh, spreadsheet that we're working on uh, where the link is, is there. It's a, it's a spreadsheet where people have listed their names, uh, their group names, the, um, their contact information, and they're also linking to the document, the collaborative document that they're uh, they're working on. So we have already two uh, groups that have started to uh, include their collaborative documents in the folder that I've listed there. Um, and the folder um, also contains all the other resources that we um, have mentioned, the announcement, the uh, instructions. Uh, so that's that's uh, another uh, um, way to connect. And uh, one other thing to mention too is we have a code of conduct. Uh, really what, what this says is to um, just, we want to create a welcoming environment, welcoming place for people um, to discuss uh, the 10 fair data things. Uh, please be kind and professional. Um, just we want this to be a, a enjoyable experience for everyone. And then um, also another way to uh, indicate that you're working on um, particular things is to use the top 10 fair uh, hashtag in Twitter. Um, and I included a, a tweet that we had sent out, um, which includes also our collaborators and partners. So if you also wanted to include them, uh, their handles are included. Um, and we might be adding more uh, more collaborators and partners as we get closer to Sprint. So just also, uh, you know, just ensure that you, you're including everyone. Uh, check back in and see if you have all the handles, if you want to include everyone, um, all the different groups working on this. And the last thing to mention is that at the conclusion of all this, once we've created these uh, 10 fair data things resources, um, We'll move all these resources um, from Google, from the collaborative docs that people are using, uh, to a repository where um, people can continue to uh, collaborate and um, uh, reuse the material in various ways. Uh, so we'll be moving that to a library carpentry repository. Um, so this concludes the the uh, um, the sprint logistics part. So I'll move on to Liz. Thanks, Chris. Okay, so some of you are probably thinking, okay, that's all very nice and well, but where to actually start? Where to start? What would actually make sense? What would FAIR actually look like for you in, in your discipline? So I think, um, I, I'm thinking in this way, like it might be something about actually um, working out what FAIR might look for you in your particular neck of the woods, okay? So are you looking for the people who are all kitted out with their fair stuff, like an exemplar combi van with the best camping setup, all the little things that fit together wonderfully and take them to amazing places? Is I mean, I'm hoping that that kind of mental image might um, inspire you onto searching out some kinds of examples or the good kinds of resources that are actually quite useful um, in communicating fair. Or alternatively, it might be actually that you don't really have a discipline, you're involved in research support, you might be a librarian, and actually what you want is for some really good, useful um, examples of what FAIR looks like in practice so you can actually begin a discussion with researchers in your area or in your um, at your campus about, about all of this um, data publication. So some examples of those might be, obviously, so we've talked a lot about this discipline-focused resources, but 
Um, I always like a good um, pop culture reference. So it could be repositories that are really, really ridiculously good looking, okay? Um, or useful metadata standards. You might be de demystifying those identifiers when you're looking for uh, examples of fair in practice. It might be validating a vocabulary or being able to talk about a particularly relevant vocabulary for someone's um, uh, area of, of research. Um, and I just wanted to say that we're going to have some sprint driver reviver stations, okay. Um, look, to be honest, I was a little bit unsure about this um, to use some very unfair type GIFs in this, but um, in a in Australia, we have these driver reviver stations around there. Um, so we're taking on, on board with that. And um, to me, driver reviver also involves some kind of um, sort of reviving um, conceptually as well. So um, we will um, we'll be listing on the ARDC website shortly those locations around there where you can drop in. Um, of course, you can also talk to people on the Gitter channel as well. And one last thing, um, oh sorry, I do need to disambiguate when I went looking for other examples of fair data was that there's also this other fair data thing but that's not us um, and it's, I don't know, there's something about fair and data just makes people want to group things in lists and make them in um, things of 10, um, but that's actually some another group. So I just want to make sure that everyone was clear about that particular disambiguation. Um, I just wanted to make a little um, plug for our next webinar on the 27th of November about making data count, um, which might be of interest to some of you on this line. Okay, um, looks like I'm the only one here at the moment. So no, you're um, not, Liz. Oh, great. <laughs> We're all just lurking in the background. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so that's the um, uh, that's the end of what I've got to say. Over to over to you, Natasha. Okay, um, so I hope this has given you a good idea of what's coming up with the sprint, and I hope it's enthused you to participate and register and get an idea together. And it's actually time for questions. Um, there was a question, a question I had sort of, can we already do a sneak of, of some of the driver reviver stations that are already mentioned or is that still secret at this point? Which driver reviver stations have we got and where do we still have gaps, people that might want to provide a driver reviver station? Liz, do you want to announce where yours is? Okay, so ours will be at uh, UTS, um, probably likely to be in the tower building, but I'll have the... I should have the final details of that um, today. So there will be a central Sydney, fairly central Sydney one at the University of Technology Sydney for those of you who'd like to drop in on us. Mm -hmm. And there'll either be one at the ARDC office or at ANU in Canberra. And we just haven't got the final uh, word on that one yet. And the rest are all sort of in play, which is why they're not actually announced yet, but we will put them on the website in the next few days. But if anyone, yes, if anyone wants to host one, please do, and we're happy to provide the cake. <laughs> That's an incentive for you. <laughs> and Chris, any driver reviver station out your way? Um, I was about to list, uh, I think there are about eight, 18 in total um, that have been registered so far. I, I was just checking. Um, I think it's, 17 in total that and there are three uh, University of California um, schools involved um, so I, I'm I myself am in North Carolina but I work for the University of California <laughs> system so I guess you can say yes locally yes there are three University of California schools um, and there and there actually I don't know if this was the question but there are two um, resources that people have shared in the uh, folder where we're sharing them at the moment. So if that's what that question was about, just of taking a peek at what's been done, then they're in the folder, um, which maybe we can share a link. I can't see the questions or comments. So if uh, one of you. Uh, sorry, um, there's a comment 
from Chris McAvaney about great overview. He has to go now, but it looks great. And he's going to be chatting with his library staff about this. And um, there's a couple of other people just saying thanks for that. Um, so I think maybe just to give people an idea of what was what people have already volunteered for to create. If you go to that registrations list link, which you can go from the Library Carpentry blog or from the ARDC website, you can actually have a look at what people have suggested they want to create a top 10 resource in. Um, there's actually quite a few different social science ones, um, which is going to be interesting. And then there's some more specific ones like history. Um, someone has volunteered to do one in software. I haven't seen it on the registrations page yet, but it's been talked about in Gitter. Um, what else, Chris, can you remember any of the others that people volunteered for? Yep. I think that covers, sorry, <laughs> I'm clicking all these different buttons. Um, I think that covers it all. Um, there are a number of other institutions that have contacted um, us that haven't registered, um, but I know for certain that the National Library of Medicine um, is interested in, and um, they're interested in, in, you know, just the medical um, thing. Um, but there's also a group that was interested in um, uh, a thing in biosciences. So I'm just <laughs> blanking on the name of it. But yeah, there are still several that have not listed uh, their um, their projects on there. So yeah. whether they need to get full approval um, or are, are they just, uh, I need to prod them again. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there's one as well on Australian government data. There's another That's one that came in yesterday. So, so there's some interesting different fair uh, topics that you can get involved in to contribute to. Um, Everyone, here's a question from Fiona Bradley. Should everyone interested in a discipline try and team up? Do you want to answer that, Chris, or do you? Um, yeah, I, 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 I think in general it's good to have someone, at least one other person, to work with a thing on, um, but you don't have to. Um, and, and another way you could do, do this is reach out through the, um, the Gitter channel. Um, or, you know, in general through Twitter and see if anyone else wants to to join you. But I think it's generally good to have just one other person you can bounce ideas off of. Um, but you don't you don't have to. You can work on it individually. Yeah. And if the other part of that question is, should the I think three different social science uh, suggestions should they all come together um, my feeling is no if there wants to if there's three different teams that want to work on this that's okay as long as they all know about each other doing this because um, it is a great global sprint and um, these teams might come up with different types of examples to use um, and you know and maybe later on um, th there could be an effort to combine them or uh, something like that but I think for the moment it's it's pretty much a free for all just dive in there and find someone to work with on this and if someone else is working on it uh, in, a, in a different area of the world then I think that's okay uh, you can either team up or just do it in parallel and I think it'll work just as nicely doing it that way. So I think we've come to the end of the questions and the end of the time. So thank you everyone for joining us for the webinar today. And we really hope to see you at the Sprint and just go to that um, Library Carpentry blog to find the links there to register and join the Gitter channel as well. Okay, thank you. Bye. And thanks to all our presenters too. <laughs> see you guys. Bye. Thanks everyone. Thank you.